And my job is to go around the world and investigate different housing issues and um, sort of see how are people faring with respect to the right to housing. But maybe you could tell me a bit about how you came to needing to have a rent strike. For me personally, I have a mouse problem, I have a cockroach problem, I've got things that need to be repaired in the building. They withhold services. They run you around in circles. They frustrate you. You get fed up. Mm -hmm. You just want to leave. But where are we going to go? The rent situation all over Toronto is the yeah, same way. It's, a, it's eviction by another name. Yeah. And have you had any response from MedCap yet? I guess it's yes. harassment. Yeah. Yeah. Bart had a sign on her. She had a sign on her balcony about the uh, rent strike, and they threatened to evict her. Uh, I'm giving you this notice because I want to end your tenancy. I want you to move out of your rental unit by such and such date. Reason. I believe that you or someone living with you has committed an illegal act. Uh, and six, a serious criminality. Yeah. Guns oh my. Drugs. For a legal action. Guns and drugs is an Oh six. my gosh. They came after her with the hardest, oh hardest gosh. category. They could. Yeah. So this was based on the banner? Yeah. You know, we're not bad mouthing them or anything. It just says May 1st rent strike. Yeah. They own 19 buildings in the area, and that's their plan for all the buildings, is to get people like us out. The neighborhood's getting gentrified, uh, if you know, familiar with Liberty Village. It's moving, it's come right up to King and Dufferin, and, and this is, it's only one direction into our neighbor, and we're in the way. urgent moment. The extent to which we're seeing urbanization collide with stagnant wages and a lack of affordability is unprecedented. So you have like poor people really struggling now, like, like never before. But then you also have the middle class unable to afford to live in cities and provide the services that are necessary for a city. I don't want to overuse the word crisis, but it suggests a crisis. So then we start asking, wait a second, who's going to live in cities? Who are cities for? It's not um, rocket science, you know? What do we think people need to have a dignified life? And it's clear that decent housing, affordable housing, is one of those things. And it's supported by international law. Kennedy Heights family is just hours away from learning whether or not they can stay in their home or be forced out onto the streets. Problem? Housing is gobbling up more shrinking paychecks. People in 59 out of 102 countries worldwide would need to save their yearly income for at least 10 years in order to buy a house in their country. There are two histories, we might say, that intersect today in that space that we call the city. And one of them is a familiar issue, which is the, what we have, for which we have used the term gentrification. When I hear people today saying it's gentrification, one reaction, an ironic reaction is, if only. It's much deeper than that. It's much more foundational. Because of the massive buying of land, of rural land, more and more people have to leave the rural areas. They come to the cities. You can see that urban land becomes precious land. Then that earlier gentrification story is sort of stand in the middle of the street with empty car parking spaces all around me and no traffic coming. This place is now a bit of a dead zone. We have very little indication of who the owners are. 
and a lot of them are completely empty, so you, you can't go up and ask them who they are, they're actually just empty all the time. One way of putting it is, this is not at all about housing. The, the buildings, they function as assets. You want those houses to be empty and unused. Because then you can play with them. Can you imagine? I mean, these dark, empty buildings. And they are making money. So when people think, oh, poor investor, something went wrong, hell no. You have yes. human rights obligations, I, I, and you can't let yeah. these investors and the financial system run amok on its own. I say, wow, human rights, every single person has a bunch of rights. And then I have a question for you, and that is... Are you a legal scholar on human rights? Do you just, yes, okay. yes so that's you right. The, you have the, the instrumentality that is the law. Exactly, because what I see is those with power, boy, can they deploy mm -hmm. the law in ways that work for them. Stuff is happening, you know? Yeah. But this, it's a typical example of the type of estates they are interested in. Yes. So every time an apartment is vacant, they start this renovation whereby they can increase the rents with uh, roughly 50%. But these uh, increased rents have no connection at all to the actual costs, why this is very, very profitable for them. They don't really want to put, tie up all their money into those houses. So what they do is look for a large number of investors and they create a security that says we own these 10,000 homes and you as the investor will get the rents and any capital gains on those properties. If you buy 1% of security, you get 1% of that flow. That means Blackstone doesn't have its own money uh, at risk to the same extent that it otherwise would be. The house, you can buy, sell, buy, sell. The asset built on that house, you can sell it in less than a second. You can sell it 35 times in an hour if you are dealing with high frequency trading. There is a total disconnect between the person living in the home and the person owning the home. Owning the house is only a means to making money. sell something, we pay money for that. Finance is totally different. I always say, finance sells something it does not have. And in doing that, it needs to actually invent brilliant instruments that allow it to invade other sectors. And that means that finance is basically an extractive sector. It might as well be mining. And the difference between finance as mining and the traditional bank is that the traditional bank wants the sons and daughters of its current clients to do better because it, it's commerce. Finance, it's like mining. Once it has extracted what it needs, it doesn't care what happens with the rest. Now, when you look at the political classes, which I hold responsible in part for a lot of the extremes that we have reached in terms of extracting value so that all our governments now are poorer than they were 
in the 1980s when this sort of begins. The value of all real estate that functions as an asset is $217 trillion. That's more than global GDP of all the countries in the world, of all the economies in the world. So you know that you're dealing with something that exits the domain of what we would call money. They are highly camouflaged extractions because they come in the shape of extraordinarily complex instruments that nobody who's not in that business can understand. The political classes, instead of doing their homework, and saying, aha, we have left traditional banking, we could all understand that, something else has happened. It's so complex that we delegate to the experts. Who are the experts? It's the financial sector itself. I was just poking around, trying to get my head around some of the um, stuff around hedge funds and buying up distressed mortgages and all of that, and I went on to the Blackstone website um, I've worked with Bruce for more than 20 years. He's an advocate and thinks so differently than anyone I know. To basically buy up the whole neighborhood, gentrify the whole thing, mm -hmm. and double or triple the value of the real estate just because you've gentrified the neighborhood and forced everybody else out. Right? Mm -hmm. And makes no, no mention of people, really, at, le at least at, by minute 16 and a half, he hasn't mentioned like the people that would be living in those places. It's like a whole other world. I definitely want to meet with him. We own properties around the globe. We buy these investments on behalf of our A company investors. like Blackstone or any of the big financial enterprises were the big winners in the crisis. Uh, they were the big winners in the housing market. Uh, they were also the big winners in the equity markets. It was as if the U.S. government rather than helping the homeowners who were losing their homes, actually sided with the banks, encouraged foreclosures to clean up the books, gave the money to the hedge funds and, and private equity firms, who then bought the, the distressed assets to make money. So it is the way that the 2008 crisis has played an important role in increasing wealth inequality in the United States and in other countries that have been afflicted by the crisis. We're dealing with a very, it's a very particular period. The elites feel free to violate basic laws and, uh, and then they're surprised that there is bitterness among the, uh, the working classes that have lost an incredible ground, I mean a lot of ground in our society. So it's a tough moment and following the money brings up a lot of very substantive reasons as to why people are so angry. They don't know exactly, they don't have the knowledge, but they know that something is not right. My own work was concerned about asymmetries of information, the fact that some people know things that other people don't, and that gives some people the ability to take advantage of others. Um, you can make more money not by making a better product and lowering cost of production, which is the standard economic analysis, but by fishing for fools, looking for people you can take advantage of. They're not creating wealth, they're actually just taking wealth. If you're somebody like the head of Blackstone, you know, I've heard him talk about the big advantages of no regulation or deregulation. Of course he wants to be able to exploit the people who are living in his properties. It is a totally dysfunctional system. In the late 1970s and 1980s, there developed, uh, I would call it an ideology, a religion, that Mark can solve all problems. There'll be big winners, there'll be big losers. In the name of equality, should the winnings be redistributed to the losers so that everybody ends up where he started? 
That would take all the fun out of the games. Uh, the high priest was Milton Friedman. The big experiment was Chile under Pinochet. It took the dictator to really implement these ideas. They thought that if we privatize, stripped away regulations, lower taxes, growth would go up. Everybody would get more. Some people will get a lot more at the top. But putting aside envy, everybody would get a bigger piece of a pie. It ignored the many instances where markets do not work well. What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? It was self-interest, or if you prefer, greed. The greed of producing... Milton Friedman gave them an economic argument for why they should be unconcerned about morality. Well, after a third of a century of this experiment, we now know that it's wrong. And that you can make money by destroying the world. And there's something wrong with that. And when I think how will finance come down, it's bringing itself down. It has, you know, extracted so much value that it's stuck now. And it's beginning to go on the other side of the curve. It is beginning to decline. You know, the amount of value, the capacity to invent more assets, we see sort of a stasis a bit. So it will bring itself down. It will come, it will come back, potentially roaring. But right now, it's a bit of stasis. <laughs> a worldwide, multi-sectoral movement. We need to change how the world thinks about and interacts with housing and, and home. And then we want to see the shift sees housing as a human right, not a commodity. Like we're going to do bullets, you know? Right. Bam. If we're going to defend cities as we know them, I can't do it alone. I decided to create a new movement called The Shift so that we can come up with ideas of how to protect our cities. So it's not an NGO movement, it's not a movement of just cities, uh, it's a movement, hopefully, of all stakeholders. The starting point that I had was these big private equity firms like Blackstone. It, it has taken me some time to ask the question, well, where are they getting their money from? Pension funds have a huge amount of money and they need to grow in order to make sure that the people who pay into the pension fund have something to live on at the end of their working lives. My mission to South Korea was planned well before I had this one piece of information, but some of the largest pension funds are right here. The National Pension Service is the third largest pension fund in the world. It was one of the poorest countries, and now it's the 11th largest economy in the world in 50 years. That's pretty impressive. But of course, to, to make that happen in a 50-year period required a kind of brutalism of massive development.
어, 누워있는 집사람을 배를 차서 No one seems to know that that's where their pension money is going. No one seems to really care. That's how we will be able to move forward, you know? It's just through some simple conversations. I did speak with a couple of representatives from the National Pension Service, and they were pretty matter-of-fact at first about you know what they have what their job is and i get it their job is to grow money for pensioners we give our money to asset managers and they then decide sort of where it gets invested and so distancing themselves from it so in other words it doesn't really matter where the pension money is going as long as it's a good return national and city governments in south korea need to make some major shifts before they will be in full compliance with their human rights obligations. You know, human rights law is very specific about those types of projects. Uh, first of all, forced eviction under international human rights is considered a gross violation of human rights. People die in forced evictions and people's lives are basically ruined. So it's not to be taken lightly. Core issues, you know, climate change, housing, they ought to be embedded into the fiduciary frameworks of pension funds. Pension funds are representing people who are going to retire. And you have to ask, how would they feel about this? Would they feel comfortable? with owning shares in a company that is that immoral. It's a familiar story. This yeah, is, this is yeah. uh, the same situation. It's the same situation we were dealing with here where they just wouldn't do repairs. They try to, they try to make your uh, living environment as toxic as possible, but you've got, you have the moral high ground. So yeah, talk to the media. And this is how we won the rent strike, correct, Barb? You're in the first month of the rent strike, and we were we went into month four. So it's a bit of a haul, but it's worth all your time and effort. So um, through some research, we've discovered that, uh, you know, the, the previous landlords who had the building, this new company came in and bought them out. And this property management company has investment companies that have certain shares. And one of them turns out to be a pension a, a government pension fund holder. So imagine you have George here on a pension and they are taking care of money for pension holders, right? Wait till they find out that somebody who's on a pension is being extorted and they're, they're pushing them out. Why are you pushing working class people out of your home? That, that's a question you have to ask these, uh, these uh, pension fund holders, right? What you around this table do can have a huge influence. It can guide other cities to prevent powerful financial actors, and they are powerful, from dismantling cities as we know them. We thought a lot about, about whether it was right, the right time for New York to sign on to this declaration, and we decided it really is. I mean, these are issues we're all grappling with. We do feel like it's a great opportunity to be um, uh, learning from each other. So we're very excited to be a part of this. Thank you very much. We should do another piece. Now Jane Dudman is back from The Guardian. I wonder about taking another kick at the can on financialization. I think we need to. The one thing, the one takeaway that they should know is that cities around the world are shifting and publicly doing so and blah blah blah.